Let's talk about the plague of pornography for just a minute. Wow, this is one of the biggest issues that so many deal with in these latter days, but few talk about it or even know how to talk about it. And when they do talk about it, it's usually in a private setting with a leader who is expected to know how to navigate struggles with pornography. Thankfully, Leading Saints has put together a remarkable resource called Liberating Saints. It's a virtual library with 25 plus presentations focused on helping leaders be better prepared to help someone overcome struggles with pornography. We cover topics like how to minimize shame in the bishop's office, how to talk with children about pornography, and even how to talk about female pornography use in Relief Society. If you'd like to review the Liberating Saints library at no cost for 14 days, simply go to leadingsaints.org 14. That's leadingsaints.org 14. While you're at it, we'll give you access to all of our virtual libraries that cover several leadership related topics. So click the link in the show notes or simply visit leadingsaints.org 14. President Tim Welch, welcome to the Leading Saints podcast. Thank you, Kurt. Nice to be here with you today. Nice. Well, and you've had the opportunity to to have that title president through a variety of, of callings in your time. But right now, uh, maybe tell us what uh, what uh, how did you end up with the, the title of president? Well, I, I've been serving here at the MTC for a while. I served as a branch president here when we came home from our full time mission experience in Ohio, and then about five months ago, was called to serve as a counselor here in the MTC presidency alongside of President Benson Porter, who's here. So it's been a nice. good experience. My wife serves as a counselor in the MTC Relief Study Presidency. So we're kind of both back into this full time at the MTC. We see senior missionaries arrive on Monday and we'll get a new group tomorrow at the MTC of young missionaries. So it's a, it's a nice. vibrant pace and a fun experience to see wonderful, dedicated missionaries. Yeah. And this is the, the Provo MTC, right? And so that's it's quite a... Uh, it is. You have all the numbers and <laughs> the yes, standards that, that comes with that, right? Yes, we do. It's kind of a slow season right now. We have maybe 500 missionaries right now. We get another 140 tomorrow. Hmm. Uh, so we're kind of gearing up for the surge that'll happen uh, after high school graduation, late June and July. So right now it's 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 not quiet, but it, it feels yeah. that way, relatively speaking. Nice. And you recently served as the mission president of uh, is it the Cincinnati, Ohio mission? Is that right? Ohio Cincinnati mission from 2016 to 2019. We had 553 young missionaries. And in addition to that, we had just over 100 senior missionaries. We had a large family history center up in Fort Wayne, uh, Indiana. So we had a lot of senior missionaries there. But it's just a remarkable experience, just yeah. totally life changing for us. So uh, being familiar with how the, you know, just from your experience serving in a mission presidency in, in Ohio, what, how, do, how is it different serving in a mission presidency for an MTC? Oh, it's dramatically different. I think, I think the MTC is more like a multinational organization. Hmm. The MTC is a large operation here with a large campus of buildings that you may be familiar with, but also involves a large group of 700 missionaries, return missionaries that are training. We have security. We have the cafeteria. Plus, we have the ecclesiastical side, which is our primary stewardship is with ecclesiastical leaders and missionaries, their experience on Sundays and Tuesday evenings and the welcome meetings on Thursdays. So it's quite a bit different. There's mm -hmm. a, such a wide range of responsibilities at the MTC, and it, and it goes much beyond just the day-to-day work of helping and training and assisting missionaries. So it's a, it's a, has a much broader reach. Yeah. And, and so one of your responsibilities you say is over the ecclesiastical portion of the MTC. That's primarily the focus of the MTC presidency. Now we, have, okay. we also have responsibilities that kind of tie us to the, the professional side of the MTC. I have training responsibilities. So I, I work with uh, the training team here at the MTC but it's prim our focus primarily is from an ecclesiastical perspective with 120 ecclesiastical leaders that are here and then all the missionaries that we uh, have branches on Sunday, devotional Sunday night, and during the week. On Tuesday night, we always have a visiting authority who's here with us. We have dinner with them at 5 and then the devotional at 7. And then we welcome missionaries with our branch presidents and their counselors and branch missionaries on Thursday evening. So it's 
that's a fun, fast paced, engaging experience. Yeah. And then, so you have roughly 500 uh, missionaries there now. Is that what you yes. said? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's so a, very similar to your Ohio mission then currently. That, that's roughly the same as what we had for the whole time <laughs> that we were in, in Ohio. Yeah. So yeah, we have, yeah. we have 500 now, which is kind of a, a relatively low number, but we have, in addition to that, we have about 75 senior missionaries that are here a week ago. We welcomed 120 senior missionaries. That's the largest group we've wow. ever seen here at the MTC. Nice. And do you have any idea of what the capacity is as far as like pre-COVID numbers at the, the Provo MTC? Um, you know, the what we what we're calculating right now is that it's about thirty percent less than the pre-COVID numbers because missionaries who are speaking English do one week at home, and mm -hmm. those that are speaking languages, foreign languages, they do two weeks at home. So. So if we had a pre-COVID max capacity of about 2,200, if you discount that by 30%, that would tell you we're at about the same level. Maybe 16, 1,700 would be here. We actually can't do have a capacity, although we've never had that many missionaries here, of just over 3,000. Yeah. But I think the max end is somewhere 22, 2,300 in the pre-COVID world, which would tell us uh, right now that that's going to be 16 or 1,700 is what we might see uh, maybe by August or September of this year. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. I, that seems like, you know, 22 years ago or so when I sat in that auditorium for a devotional, I would guess there probably was 3000 or so uh, yeah. missionaries yeah. sitting there. So, yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, currently English speaking missionaries are spending a week at home. Um, yeah. is that, and I don't expect you to divulge any insider information or anything if, if it's not public, but is that the sort of the ongoing plan for the unforeseeable yeah. future that yeah, missionaries I I think I think the uh, the reviews and all the uh, sort of analysis that's been done is is extremely favorable. Mm -hmm. so, uh, there there may have been some discussion about whether or not that was going to be changed, but I think now uh, we're finding missionaries coming here. They're anxious. They're well prepared. Uh, some of the things that we've experienced before that we've had to deal with, or that when they <laughs> arrive in field, emotional related, homesickness, and other things. They seem it just seems to be. A sweet positive experience for them. So <clears throat> we ask that question when the brethren are here frequently on Tuesday evening. And my sense is that that generally speaking, the reviews have been very, very favorable. Hmm. And I'm not, you know, I, my children are still quite young. I haven't uh, had my own missionary out per se, but is there, uh, is the MTC involved quite uh, uh, to any level um, during that first week or do they have a, a just going through a, a workbook or no, Zoom it's meetings? All, it's or? all the MTC. It's cool. okay. under the direction of the MTC. So Kelly Mills, who is here at the Provo MTC, is the administrative director for MTCs worldwide. So it's really his team. All the work that's done in terms of the online material is done under the direction of Kelly and his team of trainers. So the large group meetings that they have every day of the week and also the individual training sessions with their teachers – all of that's done uh, online via Zoom, and all that's done under the direction here of the MTC. Hmm. So it's interesting. It, it is an MTC experience. Yeah, that's great. And then, so if you're uh, if you're speaking a foreign language, do you, is, I mean, I assume Provo MTC still has those to some degree, or no? Pro Provo MTC, that's uh, Ken Packer's domain with the foreign language speaking missionaries, but they'll participate in the same large group meetings. They have a little different content for training in the second week. But all of that's done in the direction of Ken and his team for all foreign language speaking missions. Nice. All of it and, this experience. And they'll stay there a couple of months? Uh, like, like so they'll, they'll stay, they'll do the first two weeks at home. And then depending on the language, and they have this categorized by language numbers from one, two, or three. So mm -hmm. if you're speaking a language, let's say might be Spanish, which is generally considered to be something that would be a little easier to learn. You'll have, you'll have four weeks with us. If it's an Asian, if it's an a, a language like an Asian language, if you're learning Mongolian or if you're learning uh, Mandarin or Cantonese or some of the Eastern European languages, you could be here as, as many as seven weeks. That's beyond your two week at home experience. Oh, wow. Wow. So I want, I'm curious just from your experience serving as a mission president, now having this experience in the MTC, you know, that training component, um, what would what would you go back in time and tell yourself as a mission president or even maybe as a stake president in preparing young men and women for uh, missions that, uh, that this may be more profound now that you're in, in your current role? 
Um, I don't. I don't know that it would be dramatically different. Uh, certainly not as a mission president. I don't think I, I probably wouldn't teach a lot of things more differently. Yeah. Again, I think as an ecclesiastical leader, we're probably thinking about things a little differently than the professional side teaching and training missionaries how to be missionaries. But I think, yeah. I think the overarching principles that I think I would teach and try to teach now were pretty much the same as what I was teaching the first year of being in Ohio, which is really, um, it's God's work. And the doctrine behind that is, if we read from 2 Nephi chapter 27, he says it in verses 20 and 21, and you can sense that he's teaching this with, with sort of a, a very emphatic demeanor, that I am able to do mine own work. He says it twice. And mm. clearly, not just in the missionary context, but in the broader context of our experience in the church, his work is us, it's you and I, that um, his work and his glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. He can do the work. And I think what it means then is that we need to surrender our will to his will. And in there, invariably, that what that looks like, I think for most of us, that we need to teach a little bit more about becoming holy, a little bit more about personal sanctification, about what that looks like, what it feels like, and just to be deeply invested in it. I do think there can be sometimes, and I, I felt this as a mission president, where sometimes where we get so caught up in teaching goal setting and planning and teaching the, the intricacies of finding people and extending commitment invitations, which are all really good. Sometimes we get lost. We put the things that matter most at the things that matter least, as Steve Covey would teach us. I really think what we have to remember, if we connect ourselves and remember whose work this is, because then in verse 23 of that chapter that I was referring to, he tells us, he says this, behold, I am God. And I'm a God of miracles. And I will show unto the world that I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then he says this, and I work not among the children of men, save it be according to their faith. So how we engage God in the work is we exercise faith. And that's, that's shown in a variety of, of different ways. But generally, it's acting. It's doing something. And so I think as leaders, whether it's here at the MTC or the mission field or even in our home ward, I think what it's about is we need to find a way to access God's power more fully by changing us and yeah. becoming a little bit more holy to seeking a greater measure of sanctification. We don't have to be perfect in this work in any of us. We don't need to do that. But to a greater extent, as we access his power by focusing on us first, we become clean. It's, the, it's sort of the constant theme that we talked about with me, engaging members in the work. I think members get too... They're too concerned about offending a neighbor by sharing the message of the gospel. And I think what we were trying to help them understand is, is God's doing the work. He tells us in section 88 that I will hasten my work at its time. He tells us in, in section 30, 31, that I will gather mine elect from the four quarters of the earth. I will open the hearts of the people and they shall receive you. He's doing the work. Hmm. What we need to do is bring to this a measure of holiness. So what we need to do is just become a little more sanctified, become a little bit more clean. In the process, God will create all these intersecting points where we have the opportunity to share the gospel likely with people we don't even know who they are. That's yeah. how it works, and that's how we saw it happen over and over and over again. So I think we need to think less about the process of how this works and think more about the principles associated with what do I need to do to change my life. When I focus on me as a leader to becoming more clean, more holy, less judgmental, more kind, more considerate, more empathetic, then the power comes. We can access yeah. godly power that's really needful in this greatest of all works is this. Yeah. And so I'm curious as a mission president in, in Ohio, how did you go about um, making sure that that, um, that those principles were, were paramount because it's so easy, maybe easy to sort of will, try and will these things, you know, into the existence and whatnot, you know, yeah. I'm going to make this miracle happen when, yeah. when there's, we need to create space for faith there. So as a mission president, how did you approach that to keep your, your missionaries engaged? Well, I, you know, it is, it's always a challenge. I, 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 I learned early on that when everything's important, nothing's, nothing is important. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, if, if I start talking about five things, they, they, they have trouble remembering what I think is the most important or what Sister Welch and I were trying to teach them. And so this issue that we're talking about here in terms of holiness, about personal sanctification, um, I felt like it, it sort of, I had to define my ministry based upon that. And then that, that still gave me enough latitude that we could teach the principles in Preach My Gospel. Uh, yeah. The first, really, the first six chapters are more about this that we're talking about. They're more, they deal more with preparing oneself from the inside out. Except for chapter seven, which is about language, the re- the following chapters beyond that, the six chapters beyond that are about skill based training, and so I think there needed to be we needed to do both. But I found that as soon as I got very very far away from the central message, which is being holy, being clean, they drifted pretty fast, and so yeah. I, I somehow felt like in every meeting of, with missionaries and in interviews. It was something that I couldn't get very far away from. We had to stay connected to the central theme is, number one, this is God's work. We access his power to do his work based upon us, our cleanliness, our holiness, our own efforts to be sanctified. So it, it, it was a challenge. There's no question, I think, as it is for every leader. But I think, I think the more you can stay home and stay with the things that you really care about and will make the greatest difference, I think it's easier to stay on message. Yeah. And with that message of like, you know, staying holy and, and clean and did that, was there a clear message of like the, the obedience in the mission and, um, and obviously making sure you're, you're worthy to be there and whatnot, or is that how it was typically interpreted and, and applied? Um, I, th- yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I, it was more taught like this. Um, I would, I would say, um, before, as as rebellious Israel came out of Egypt, and um, they had waited a time, and before God was ready for them to return return to the Holy Land to reclaim that land, mm-hmm. um, Joshua was gathering his troops together before they go back in. This is a a hedonistic group of people who were occupying that land, and I think God was grateful to have Joshua and his team and the Israelites go back into it. But of all the things he could have said, what he says is, I mean, you, you might think you'd be talking about battle strategy and sharpening swords, but in Joshua chapter three, verse five, he's reminding them of this. And this is, this is sort of the theme that would have been central to the things I taught in the, in Ohio and it, it really here with missionaries. He says this, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do wonders among mm-hmm. you. So that's sort of the broad message. It, it connects us with God. If we seek to sanctify ourselves, sure, we've, we've got to be able to teach the skill-based aspects of missionary work. But I felt like, for me, it was more important to have senior missionary leaders doing that. I mean, I, I love to teach about goal setting and planning, and I love to teach about finding. But I felt like my ministry really had to stay centered and focused on this sort of holistic aspect of missionary life, which is none of this is going to matter if you're not getting up in the morning. We, that's how we exercise faith. When God said, I do I, that. I work not among the children of men, save it be according to their faith. You can't, you can't access God's power if you're sleeping in or if you're getting in late, or if you're spending an hour and 20 minutes rather than 59 minutes with members. So we would, I would talk about that repeatedly about what it looks like. But I tried always to start with just the central theme, we need to be clean. Hmm. The Spirit will direct you. It will provide you with the information you need. The Spirit is the ultimate, the quintessential teacher of gospel topics, and it will work with you. You don't need me whispering in your ear in the morning to get out of bed. You know that. You know, for the more that we have missionaries who are clean and seeking to be holy, I remind them, and I'll talk to them, but... The spirit is the ultimate director of, you know, a real helping us get realigned. And, and frankly, for to be perfectly honest with you, we did it. We had some instances with missionaries that struggled. The vast majority of them, I think, really sought to be clean. They understood what it meant like meant to be to look like to be holy. And I, I, you know, I, that's one of the proudest things that I think for Sister and Welch and I both is that 
we had missionaries who really bought into this idea that we were trying to become sanctified as a mission and then let God do the work. We'll take it if there are a lot of baptisms, if there are not any baptisms. As long as we're working hard and exercising faith and doing everything we can do to be clean, it's his work. Yeah. It's yeah. his work. We leave that to him. Yeah, I really like that, that, you know, because there you, we sort of run into the, the similar dynamics with leading saints as we, you know, we love the new cool idea or tactic or approach of, you know, hitting the numbers or whatnot, but to sort of step back and just say, well, let, let's do our own work first before we worry about doing other people's work, right? Let's sanctify ourselves and then naturally we'll, we'll sanctify others as we get in that, that frame of mind rather than the, the cool new tactic, right? Well, I, I think there is a kind of great seduction for leaders sometimes in the church where we, we bring things from our professional life into our life as an ecclesiastical leader. And, and I think we've all done that from time to time. And we have mm -hmm. a tendency to start thinking strategically about things that we can do and to communicate messages. And I think it's great. I think it's, it's fine. And I think those things need to be talked about. But I, I don't think, I think it's the wrong question. I think hmm. when we're thinking strategically about things in this work, it's God's work. And, and really the essence, I think, behind really outstanding leaders in the church at any level, at a ward level or at a stake level, or certainly all the, the senior leaders in the church headquarters, it, they model what it looks like to be holy and to clean. And uh, then having a vision for the work and understanding, you know, how you can help and minister primarily to the one, um, it makes more sense then. Yeah. But God will, he'll teach you, he'll teach us as to how we can reach out and minister one by one. I've heard Elder Bednar say, he said that something to the effect that he's, his experience as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve has taught him that he will send members of the Twelve all around the world. And they'll speak at leadership conferences and at state conferences. He sp says, but invariably, what I've learned, it's about one person. It's about finding a way in a situation to minister to one. And I, I really, I think that's the essence of what it is we're trying to do here in any aspect, in any role of leadership. And then consequently, I think if there is a panacea for leadership in the church, it's, it's fixing me. Mm. Me to become more clean. Me to become more holy. And then trust in the process that with all the resource material that the church has given us, which is extraordinary, that coupled with the direction from the spirit, which is the ultimately, ultimately the greatest teacher, then it's hard for me to, you know, to really make mistakes that are catastrophic. You know, even yeah. guys like me can somehow find a way to get through this experience without destroying the church. You know, we can still do it <laughs> if we trust that God will help us. He'll bless us. But I think he's asking for us. He's reminding us that it's his work. First and foremost, it's his work. And I, that's true whether you're a primary teacher, you're a mission president or a bishop or whatever you do in the church. Fix me. Work on me. I need yeah. to get clean. I can repent more. I think that's what he wants. He wants us to bring him hearts and hands that are clean and pure. And then he'll give us the opportunity to work miracles yeah. in, in this great sacred work. And then, you know, oftentimes missions get a bad rap when it comes to, to numbers and, you know, sometimes overly focused on, on numbers and results and whatnot. But obviously there, I think generally most people agree that there's a time and a place and a purpose for numbers. And so with this message, like I, I would imagine there still comes a time for production and results. How did you balance that or, or did you? Well, I don't, you know, I, I honestly would tell you that I, I never felt like that it was my role to balance that. Okay. Um, I, I felt like the missionary's purpose was, were there to, they were there to teach repentance and baptize converts, but I didn't think that was my role. Oh, okay. I, I thought my role, and I, I know that there can be some misunderstanding among different mission presidents about that topic. And I think there is a tendency to feel like there's a, an encouragement to, to baptize. But when I speak privately with the brethren about it, what I sense more than anything else is this sort of seeding indifference. They're not concerned about the numbers. They're concerned most especially about what happens to missionaries when they come home. That's the overarching concern, I think, among the brethren about 
yeah. life in the mission field. So that that doesn't that doesn't mean we shouldn't do everything we can, every possible thing to exercise faith so that missionaries are fulfilling their divine mandate to preach the gospel of repentance and baptized converts. We should be doing that. And I think I think the miracles of baptism will come, but honestly, I don't I didn't feel like I spent a lot of time ruminating about convert baptism numbers. Um, I, what I was current, concerned about is that we were doing what we should have been doing in, al- in alignment with what God wanted us to do. And that's primarily engaging members in the work, because when that happens, rather than just missionaries going out and finding people, sometimes if there's a lot of emphasis on baptizing, they end up in neighborhoods they shouldn't be in, teaching people that really don't have a hope of being real active in the church. But when mm-hmm. we engage members, we we have this capacity to enlist a faith multiplier where we have a lot of members that are working with us. And that's, I think ultimately is what God wants us to do because he's, I believe this Curtis, he's, he's as equally interested in sanctifying gathered Israel as he is in gathering scattered Israel. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where this faith multiplier can be a blessing to the church as missionaries engage with members and exercising faith. That's what every priesthood leader in this church wants. I think every Bishop, every branch president, when we talk to them about missionary work, some of them can roll the rise and say, well, the last five converts that came to our branch are less active. Why should I get engaged in missionary work? The message to that is always about increasing faith among members. If we can find ways to be able to increase faith, we become more active in the church. It's likely we'll have temple recommends and participate in temple worship more often and pay tithing. Those are all things that every priesthood leader wants. And I think we need to sort of reshape the message a little bit, I think, as leaders, as it relates to missionary work, so that leaders, priesthood leaders, it really needs to be them that are directing the work of finding through members. And the extent to which we can see that happen in our mission, we went from pretty low numbers of convert retention levels in the high teens to low 20s to near the end of our service in the high 70s and and mid to high 80s in some of our stakes because the fight that everything changed around finding two members. And I think, yeah. I think when we make this issue about baptism, we miss the most important message is that what are these, what are these young missionaries going to be doing in 10 years? They're going to be faithful in the church. If they had an experience that really transforms them, that can't be measured by convert baptisms. It's measured by a deepening in faith and personal conversion in this sacred work. That's what meant the most to me. Always. It meant the most. Wow, that's powerful. And I'm, I'm curious if you have any more insight on just that relationship between local leadership and missionaries. Uh, sometimes there's this passive aggressive, you know, awkward uh, push and pull that, that's happening there. And and um, and sometimes I, I feel I'm currently serving in our, our ward mission. And sometimes I feel that as well, sort of there's this expectation that the missionaries bring to us as a ward. And we're sort of like, well, we sort of have expectations for you. And, you know, and then there's this, yeah. this silent battle that it's happening with smiles, you know, um, any, anything that you learned or insight you have as, as far as well, that dynamic between local leaders and missionaries? Well, I, I can just tell you from my own experience what I found. And I think what I found mostly was what you're describing. And I, I think it's, it's sort of generations of, of us as missionaries, as full-time missionaries, mission presidents and missionaries. I think, um, I think we're asking members sometimes to engage in high-risk activities where I don't think that's what the Lord wants us to do. And again, you're hearing my opinion about this topic. <laughs> right. But here's the thing is when I have to you know, take over some warm bread to the neighbors that have lived by us for five years – and hand them the bread and then maybe invite them to come to a family home evening. That's high risk behavior. And it's, there will be some members that will do that or talk to the person that they are at work with about it. But we get very few members that engage with us because it is high risk. We were putting at risk a relationship. And I think, I think if we, if we can change the message, and this is what we were trying to say to our state presidents, What we want you to do here is just simply this. We teach the doctrine about finding, which were some of the things that I referred to earlier. God's doing the work. I will hasten my work in this time. He's doing the work. But he doesn't do it without an exercise of faith. So here's what we're, this is all we're asking you to do. But it needs to be your message. It can't come from me. You hold the keys to the members in your stake. 
But this is what they need to hear from you. Because I think if you'll do it, you'll find that we'll, rather than having a very small percentage who will gain and find that will actually engage with us in finding, because they don't want to do it. And here's the truth. I don't want to do it either. That's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. but here, but let me just, let me just tell you what this looks like. I'll, I'll, so I'll tease that to a, the, a group of state presidents and say, this is what we want you to do. Have them sincerely pray for missionary opportunities and just trust that God will lead them to those opportunities. Do it every day. As a family that we're thinking about, we're praying for, we'll ask missionaries to work with members, but they'll teach the lessons. They'll just pray for them. Maybe have a copy of the Book of Mormon that, that's just a reminder. Every day we pray for missionary experiences. So the story looks like this, and this is what we're trying to te- have, to have our missionaries teach members. So if they're in a war council meeting, or if they're in a sacrament meeting, or if they're in a weekly meet correlation meeting with the board mission leader, it looks like this. And everybody has their own stories. So last week after his own conference, let's just say, this actually happened, but we had our assistants meet us in an Applebee's restaurant just outside of, um, just north of Dayton, Ohio. They arrived earlier, and it happened to be the NCAA championships that were basketball tournaments going on. So when they arrived, they sat them there so they could see a television, and they were uncomfortable with that. So they asked, they asked the uh, waitress to reseat them somewhere else in the restaurant. So by the time we came, they'd already made one move. They were sitting at, at, sitting at the back of the restaurant. They, they escorted Sister Welch and I over to the table. We sat down, and then a, la- a young lady, maybe in her early 30s, uh, came and handed us the, the – uh, menus. And I said to her, this is, this is how, this is the, this is the extent of the complexity of what, of what I would do as a, as a mission president. I said to her, have you ever met a couple of Mormon missionaries? And she says to me, funny thing, you know, when I was 12, I lived up here in Huber Heights and my next door neighbors were all members of the church. And I went with them to church meetings. Then I started going to girls camp with them. Went for about three or four years. And then we moved. I married. We've got three kids. You know, my husband and I last week, we were just saying, you know, we really need to find a church to go to. Funny thing. <laughs> we can help you with that. Yeah. I, what, I guess that, well, I tell you that story, that, and that sounds sim- simplistic, I know. But if you're listening to that as a member, and I would say, this is what we want you to do. It's probably somebody you don't even know. It's going to be somebody you talk to at the AT&T store. It's going to be somebody that you run in a sort of what seems to be a serendipitous way at the grocery store, somewhere else that your lives intersect. If you really believe that this is God's work and you pray and exercise faith and you seek a greater measure of cleanliness, just repent a little bit more, God will do the work. We don't, we're not asking you to go knock on the doors of your neighbors. That's not what we're asking you to do. We're asking you to exercise faith. But if, if it's not me, if it's the state president, who that's his message at state conference, this is low-risk behavior. We're trusting God that he'll do the work. He'll help us find people for the missionaries to teach. Once the state president owns that and the branch president and the bishop own that, so that it's their message. They're responsible, really, for gathering scattered Israel in the state. We're just here to help and teach. But it isn't missionaries that we should be making people feel guilty. We shouldn't be coercing them. We shouldn't be asking them when they're going to talk to their neighbors. (laughs) I don't want to do that either. Honestly, I don't want to do that. But I'll pray right away. And and those kind of experiences, and we've had so many, and Sister Michelle and I have had our own experiences that very same way ourselves. God will do the work. Let's trust him. Let's get out of the way. Let's just let him do the work and lead us. And all we need to do is in those moments, we need to be willing to say, Funny thing, you, ever, yeah. you know, that's it. I mean, that, it's not any more complicated than that. But I think sometimes members, we get fearful when the topic comes up in a priesthood or really meeting and we're thinking we're going to be asked to do something we don't want to do. Yeah, <laughs> I'm with you. I don't want to do it yeah. either. <laughs> There's another way to do it. <laughs> it really yeah, is comforting to hear. <laughs> it has greater impact, I think, in terms of building God's kingdom because we engage members. Now we get people who will engage with us because yeah. they listen to that story and they'll say, I can do that. I'll do that. Right. Is that what yeah. you're talking about? Yeah. I can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this over here that you were telling me before about the warm bread, I can't do that. I just don't feel comfortable. I feel disingenuous. It feels inauthentic because I feel like I'm trying to manipulate them. I'm trying to, I'm taking the pose of being kind, a kind, loving neighbor, but really what I'm trying to get to is to get them to come to family away. Yeah. 
No, I, I love this, this approach as far, you know, seeing as a low risk, you know, finding the low risk activity in it all. And I remember a time I was, uh, I was in a, a condo. Uh, we had uh, neighbors below us and the missionaries came over. The neighbors below us were not members of the church and, and missionaries came over. They had dinner and, you know, you sort of expect it. You're sort of bracing for the end of the meal The ask, like, who are you going to refer us to? And so we did that. And I sort of stopped and said, elders, just a minute here. Let me tell you something like I'm not going to walk downstairs and ask if this guy wants to come to church. What I can do is I know we both like movies and I can invite him to a movie. And that movie that, you know, going to a movie together, that will continue to develop a relationship with him to the point that if he has a hard time or wants to reach out to God or find a church that he'll ask me about it. So why don't I commit to you that I'll ask him to a movie? They're like, okay. And then I said, will you follow up with, up with me and make sure I do that? And they're like, yeah, I, we can do that. And so everybody was happy because it was a low risk behavior and I was yeah. happy to do it. Yeah. But I, I, I do think if they, if rather than focusing on your neighbor, they were just focusing on just we just pray every day that God yeah. will give an opportunity somewhere and just trust that it'll happen. It might be somebody downstairs, but it's more likely to be somebody that you don't even know who they are. There'll yeah. be an opportunity. And I think what, I think the response that we all make is I can connect with this idea that it's God's work. He's gathering scattered Israel. I just need to exercise faith. That's my part that I play here. And if I can do that by just, I connect uh, repenting is an exercise of faith. I get, I'm, it's an action because I seek to be more clean, to be more holy. That's what he wants. He wants us to be prepared because it's his work and his glory for us to be exalted with him. That's the essence of what he's trying to do here. Yeah. And so yeah. anything that starts to, you know, feel a little bit manipulative is really hard. I think for most people, for most of us, including me. So <laughs> yeah. it really has to be, I think, I think really what God wants us to do is, is exercise faith, let him do the work and then he'll give us opportunities that will be comfortable. It will be as the brethren say, normal and natural. Those are the things we're looking for those experiences, but most likely they're people you don't know and it'll be yeah. very comfortable for you to do. It'll be very easy for you to do it. Yeah, that's so true. So true. We started this interview with, uh, you know, I typically ask for some general principles and, uh, and you know, that helped you and served you well in, in different uh, leadership capacities. And you sent me uh, three words, vision, character, and passion. I think we've, we've touched on these, you know, obviously character is, has a lot to do with being sanctified and, and being holy and, you know, establishing that vision, but anything else, any other component of those three words that we haven't hit on that you want to make sure we, we do before we wrap up? You know, I don't think so really. I mean, that, those came from, a uh, the book that I published in before a mission uh, about defining skill as it relates to selling in the selling world. Mm -hmm. But I, I, and I think the principles can apply, but they're probably not principles I'd be teaching in a setting like this. They would teach in a secular way about the importance of having a sense of vision and having passion for the work. But I, I guess, I guess my message to you and those that would be listening, it, my experience has been and I've taught sales leaders all around the country in various international locations for 40 years. I think that message is applicable in the business world. But here in the church, understanding for all the reasons I mentioned earlier, it's God's work. It's done differently. Yeah. He, he tells us in Isaiah chapter 55, my thoughts are not your thoughts and neither are my ways your ways. And as though the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts and your thoughts, my ways and your ways. I think he's trying to remind us, I don't do it like you think you ought to do it. It's not done like that. He tells us in the 19th chapter of the doctrine, 19th section of Doctrine and Covenants, verse 38, he says, pray always and I will pour out my spirit upon you. And then he says this, and great shall be your blessing, yea, even more than if you should obtain the treasures of the earth. How many of us really believe when God says this, he's trying to tell us the greatest thing I could give you in mortal life is the understanding the fullness of my spirit, recognizing the power of the Holy Ghost as a member of the Godhead that you can have personal companionship with. You think it's money. You think it's position. You think it's celebrity. I think what he's trying to do is debunk that, that notion of American pop culture and say, it's not that. <laughs> Just pray always, I'll give you my spirit, and great shall be your blessing, yea, even more than if you should obtain the treasures of the earth. So when we think about doing things in, in the Lord's kingdom, it has to start with the way he does things. And I think that's why those principles, they're applicable. I think they're important leadership principles. I agree. But in not in, the, in this work, 
we have to align ourselves with God's will completely and determine what it is that he wants for us to do as leaders, sometimes who hold keys, others who have delegated responsibilities from those who hold keys to be able to perform a great work. Once we feel clean, once we felt the power, his spirit, he'll teach us all things that we should do. Yeah. It's not any more complicated than that. Honestly, he's doing the work. He'll do it. Amen. Through us. Amen. So I'm curious about uh, this concept of, of passion, because oftentimes, you know, I think it's obvious why passion is important and whatnot. But as leaders, we, we want to infuse passion into others, right? Maybe if I'm 10 times as passionate, they'll be five times as passionate, right? We, yeah. we want to like uh, fuel them with passion because, uh, you know, this is important work. And if they're passionate and they're, they're motivated. So any, any advice you'd have as far as the concept of passion in terms of, of leadership? Well, here's the thing. I think there is some doctrine behind it. And I think if we understand the doctrine, then I think it, it will help us uh, understand how to access the power that comes from that. And I think it's something that's too commonly misunderstood, particularly among young men and young women. Um, the doctrine is this. In Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, he reminds us that as he or she thinketh in his heart, so is he or so is she. In 2 Nephi chapter 9, verse 39, we're reminded that to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life eternal. We read from the 121st section of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord speaking in verse 44, and he says, Let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly, he says, and then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God, and the Holy Ghost shall be your constant companion. And then if you think about what we do every Sunday in this, the sacred ordinance of the sacrament, we make specific covenants. In the first blessing on the bread, we, we covenant to take upon ourselves the name of Christ to always remember him and keep his commandments. In the second, the blessing on the water, we only do one thing. And the only promise we're making is that we will always remember him. And it promises that we have his spirit to be with us. <clears throat> I found in our experience in the mission field, that what I needed to teach and help missionaries understand is these, this tremendous power that comes from learning a greater measure of self-mastery and controlling what you think about. That we, it's the only thing we have complete control over. You don't get to control the weather. You can't control politics. And here's this, here's this troubling news for many. You can't control your kids. You can't. You can influence them when they're young, but you, don't, you can't. There's nothing you can control. You can't even control your health. You can influence it. The only thing that God has given us complete control over is the ability to control what we think about. And my experience of having taught this in a number of different ways over the years, having, having young missionaries understand this reality, there's a difference between subconscious mind and conscious mind. Subconscious mind is where we start daydreaming. We start drifting off. And what is true, the science would tell us, is that the subconscious lacks the capacity to differentiate between fact and fiction. So what it means then, when I start thinking about something, and I don't know how many times, 100 times, as a state president or as a mission president, I have, I have people come into my office, missionaries or members of the stake, and say, I just, you know, I just, I feel guilty. I, feel, I don't feel worthy. We'll talk about it. And they've repented of things some time ago. The scripture refer to this process as, a dog returning to his vomit or a fool to his folly. Hmm. We're repentant things that we've taken care of some time ago. When we start marinating in it, because of, we start drifting into that subconscious mind, um, it produces the natural physiological, biological, emotional response because it thinks that's what we want. And so we feel guilty. And we find, I think the strategy of the adversary with most of these young missionaries he wasn't trying to get them to go to Vegas. He was just trying to get them to think about something stupid they did Friday night when they were 17 in high school. And they start thinking about it for 15 minutes because it's a sensory rich image. They feel guilty. They feel unworthy. And then they're calling me and saying, you know, president, I, we need to talk. I just, I just don't feel worthy. We talk about it. There's nothing that they haven't done. It's other than the fact that they're going back and reliving something that I think the adversary, the, the great seduction is, we don't actually have to do it again. And that's the reason why pornography is such a pervasive plague, is that there are digital images that we can access anytime if we've seen enough of that, that debris. Mm -hmm. And so the minute I start going back and, and spending time thinking about it, 
then it's like the spiritual equivalent of a sprained ankle or a twisted knee. I, I just don't, I can't testify with the same conviction or the same power because I'm feeling guilty about something, <laughs> something I did five years ago, for heaven's sakes. So this inability, the passion, the passion piece is connected to what we think about. If we can re-harness this, so rather than, I'm, the strange thing is, Kurt, I think when we commit to say that we'll always remember him, I actually think that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to always remember him. So it's pervasive in our lives so that it's not things that we've done before that we have, that we've repented of and taken care of. But the more that we can immerse our lives, that's why scripture reading is so important. So it, it sort of fills us that we think about the characters. We think about the experience. We're drinking it. We're breathing it in. And the more we think about them, about him and start envisioning our lives in the way that he wants us to, the passion comes from that place. It's Katie Ledecky, if you remember a 14-year-old girl who was preparing for the Olympics. Years, this is years ago, before her first gold medal, when she said, when somebody asked her the question, how do you, how do you get up in the morning and spend at 4 o'clock and get in the pool and spend seven hours a day swimming? And you know what she says? She said, well, I can, I can see myself in my mind standing on the podium with a gold medal around my neck. I can hear the music. I can see the flag. I can see my parents. She was having an experience where she could actually experience the end, you know, two years before she was actually at the Olympic Games. That's the power of the subconscious mind if we learn how to control what we think about. To eliminate all this negative debris that the adversary is trying to foist upon us, that as we become more clean and holy, we can write our own program. We can play our own movie trailers. They don't even have to have happened yet, but we can see our life and what we want it to look like. As we do that, then naturally the process of the human body and the, and the psychology of the, of the subconscious mind, it'll give us passion and energy, a desire, because we become what we think about. That's the doctrine. And as we let virtue garnish our thoughts unceasingly, of course, why are we surprised? Then our confidence will wax strong in the presence of God so we can actually be in the same room with him and not feel diminished. Because we will just simply the process of letting virtue garnish our thoughts. We control what we think about and see our lives that we actually can claim the privilege of becoming a joint heir with Christ and receive all that the Father has. That's the essence of passion, in my judgment. The more that we can teach that and understand it, so young men and young women understand it, they're not victims by the adversary. We get to make conscious choices about it. It's the only thing we can control. Lives change. I, I think it's one thing that if we understood more, changed everything else about our experiences, not only leaders, but also members of the church. We have the power to change what we think about. And in the process, it changes literally the trajectory of our lives if we can do that. Hmm. Love it. That's so good. Well, Tim, uh, this has been fantastic. And I, I want to squeeze in a quick shout out to your son, Adam, who, who arranged this meeting today. And I think now all that are listening are glad and grateful for, for Adam for, for doing that. And, uh, you know, he, he was setting this up and he said, Hey, when you get my dad on there, would you mind just having him mention a charity golf tournament that, he, that Adam's working on. And, and I said, absolutely. And so I guess it's a, a local tournament here in Utah called the Father's Day Classic Tournament. Day Classic. What details do you have on that? Father's Day Classic is an event that, that Adam started last year. And it's a, it's a wonderful event that's right the Friday before Father's Day at Thanksgiving point that interestingly enough, the, the field in the morning, the four man scramble is already sold out. There are some spots, I think in the afternoon for the, for the dads and their son, young sons or daughters to play in the junior event. Um, but it really is all about fathers standing up to child abuse. That's really the essence of what the message is about. And I think he's done a wonderful job in being able to get some great sponsors who are there uh, helping and supporting this phenomenal cause. And he, they were able to make a considerable donation to prevent child abuse in Utah, a nonprofit in the state. And uh, I think he's just done tremendous work. I'm really proud of him. So, yeah, if any of your listeners have an interest in get, being a part of that, of uh, participating and joining arms with Adam and his team with preventing child abuse in Utah. Uh, that's a great event. Wonderful event. I'm sure he'd be yeah. happy to find ways to utilize you if you. Yeah, well, we'll definitely put the, the details in the, in the show notes and I'm, I'm, I can get behind that mission any day. And so I'm glad we can, can speak about it for a moment and push people towards that, that event. And, uh, what a, what a great thing to do. So, um, 
Tim, the last question I have for you is as you reflect back on your different opportunities of leadership, both, you know, as in your current role and as in the, in the mission presidency to being a mission president, stake president, bishop, how has being a leader helped you become a better follower of Jesus Christ? Well, you know, I, I think it's interesting you would ask that question. I think it's an interesting question because really, if you think about what we've been talking about, really, it's really the way that I can increase, enhance my own discipleship is that I seek to be clean. If I, if I really believe that as a husband, as a father, and as a priesthood leader in the church, that really it starts with me being more clean, more holy, chances are I'm probably a better dad. Probably chances are I'm a better husband and father. And I, and I think it's always true that the more that I seek to be clean and holy and recognize whose work this is, that it enhances my discipleship. It brings me closer to Him because when I feel the majesty of His power in my life, when I repent and feel clean from Him, I have a greater measure of devotion and love. I love Him more. I desire to serve Him more. I feel a greater sense of closeness to Him. So the essence of everything about leadership in the church is to change us from the inside so that our desires, our appetites, our passion, we have no more disposition to do evil but to do good continually, as we learned from King Benjamin. That's really the essence of it. And in the process of that, it brings us closer to Christ, that we love Him more and have a greater desire to serve Him. That's the essence of discipleship, which is really, I think, I think the essence of what leadership is about is becoming more like Him, more like Christ, and loving Him more. And we can do that first and foremost by becoming more holy. And that concludes this How I Lead interview. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I would ask you, could you take a minute and drop this link in an email, on social media, in a text, wherever it makes the most sense, and share it with somebody who could relate to this this experience. And this is how we how we develop as leaders, just hearing what the other guy's doing, trying some things out, testing, adjusting for your area. And uh, that's where great leadership's discovered, right? So we would love to have you uh, share this with uh, somebody in this calling or a related calling, and that would be great. And also, if you know somebody, any type of leader, who would be a fantastic guest on the How I Lead segment, reach out to us. Go to leadingsaints.org slash contact. Maybe send this in individual an email, letting them know that you're going to be suggesting their name for this interview. We'll reach out to them and uh, see if we can line them up. So again, go to leadingsaints.org slash contact, and there you can submit all the information and let us know. And maybe they will be on a future How I Lead segment on the Leading Saints podcast. And remember, go to leadingsaints.org slash 14 to access our full Liberating Saints virtual library. It came as a result of the position of leadership which was imposed upon us by the God of heaven who brought forth a restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the declaration was made concerning the own and only true and living church upon the face of the earth, we were immediately put in a position of loneliness. The loneliness of leadership from which we cannot shrink nor run away, and to which we must face up with boldness and courage and ability.